I want to invite you uh, to turn. We're going to look at two passages today, but we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, so if you turn in your Bible there, uh, or if you want to use the one that's in the pew in front of you there, uh, Ephesians chapter 1 is one of Paul's letters uh, to the church. Um, and I'll remind you that uh, as part of this sermon series, grace is still amazing, that we're going to look at kind of a different aspect of grace um, each uh, week that we're together. Um, we've looked at using this uh, acrostic, the word gospel, uh, we've looked already at these two things. First, just grace, what it is and why it's so important to us. And then last week, we looked at what we called obligatory grace that has to do with our sin. Because of our sin and our helpless estate, that we have to have God's grace. Um, and we'll talk actually a little more about that um, in this idea this week uh, of God's sovereign grace. You heard the choir sing about God's sovereignty. It actually was uh, kind of built into both the hymns that we've already sung today. It's that in God's grace is he's acting as the one who's in charge of our salvation. Now this isn't a new concept, certainly not here and not uh, over the course of Christianity, but it is something that ought to be vitally important to us to understand. Um, and here's why. Um, it gets to this. Um, I, I read this uh, about a Presbyterian pastor from many years ago in the early part of the 19th century. That'd be the early 1800s. And his name, unfortunately, was Ichabod. Um, a guy, his name was Ichabod Spencer. And if you know from Old Testament, the name Ichabod is really not one you want to be named after. Um, it was a child um, back in the Old Testament when um, a priest had sinned greatly against God and, and um, after he had died, his grandson was named Ichabod, meaning God departed. Um, but this was a man of God, preacher uh, whose name was Ichabod Spencer. And he wrote a little book that um, lots of people have enjoyed for uh, a long, long time called Pastor Sketches. Um, and it's kind of his um, describing of ministry and as was the custom of the time, described lots of uh, conversations in detail that he had. And this is one of the stories that he tells. He says, after the service, a well-educated woman came to him and thanked him for his sermon. She said, oh, sir, it has done me good. All my life I've been troubled with this doctrine that you preached about today. I've studied it for more than 20 years in vain, but now I know what has been the matter. I have never been entirely willing to let God be God. I've never been entirely willing to let God be God. Spencer concludes, and when you are entirely willing that God should be God, this doctrine will trouble you no longer. What was the doctrine that was being preached that day? It was really the sovereignty of God. It was sovereign grace, and that doctrine is sometimes called election. And it causes great consternation in the lives of a lot of Christian people trying to understand exactly what does it mean to be an elect person of God. And it's like many of the words, a lot of people, even the ones who don't prefer a strict understanding of it, have to admit it's a word that's in the Bible many times. In fact, God's people are called the elect so it has to mean something to us. Well, I think we can't understand what it means to be chosen by God out of his sovereign grace if we don't first understand what we talked about last week. And let me just remind you, and I ran across uh, in a book I was reading this week, uh, I hope what uh, is a summary from what you may remember from last week. Listen to this. Because of Adam's transgression, his descendants enter the world as guilty, lost sinners. That means all of us, guilty, lost sinners. As fallen creatures, that's the term we use, that we are um, people of the fall, I mean we've fallen away from God's grace. We no longer worship God, serve God, and love God. They have no desire to have fellowship with the Creator. He is holy and just and good, whereas they are sinful, perverse, and corrupt. And I hope you know that they is us. We don't mean they out there. We mean we is us, sinful, perverse, and corrupt. Left to our own choices, we will inevitably follow the God of this world and the will of our father, the devil. 
Consequently, men have cut themselves off from the Lord of heaven and forfeited all rights to his love and favor. It would have been perfectly just for God to have left all men in their sin and misery and to shown mercy to none. You get that statement? It would have been perfectly just. Like God wouldn't have been unfair, unrighteous, or unjust by showing mercy to no one. God was under no obligation whatsoever to provide salvation to anyone. It is in this context that the Bible sets forth this doctrine that we're calling sovereign grace. Other places it's called election. The choosing of sinners for salvation is sovereign grace. Now, the belief in this has to come from a God-centered view of the universe. Because if we get it wrong and we make ourselves the center of the universe, we call that a man-centered view of the universe, then we start at it from the complete wrong direction. If we look at it from me outward, we're never going to make sense of that. We have to look at it from God's perspective. We see God's absolute control over all things. In fact, one author, Brian Cosby, says this. We see God's absolute control over all things. There's neither one square inch nor one single molecule that is outside of God's control. That's God's sovereignty. Either he is or he isn't. God can't be mostly sovereign or a little bit sovereign. Either he is or he isn't. And if he is, it's over every single inch and molecule of this universe. He quotes Isaiah 46, 11, saying, God has declared the end from the beginning, saying, I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. See, when God says that, he's not making a threat or a promise or anything of that nature. He's stating the fact that if God says, if I purpose to do it, it will be done. And he does so out of justice, out of righteousness, out of holiness. So, where does that leave us? If we believe what we looked at last week, that our hearts are not free to submit to God, If our hearts are not free to submit to God, they are locked away, chained away. What Romans chapter 3 said to us, no one is righteous. But do you remember what it said in the next verse? No one seeks after God. No one understands. You see, if we can't understand the gospel, if we can't seek after God ourselves, then there has to be sovereign grace. God has to do the work. It's not that we don't want to do that. We can't do that. And because we can't, we don't want. We don't seek after God, again, as Romans says. And apart from God's grace giving us new hearts to love him, we remain chained and imprisoned by sin and unbelief. There is no freedom apart from God's grace. And it's grace precisely because his salvation is something we don't deserve. That's the foundation of understanding what I want to speak to you about today. I want to take you to Ephesians chapter 1 and answer this question. What does God say about choosing people who are helpless sinners like us? Now I'm taking for granted that you agree with what we looked at from God's word last week. If you don't believe you're all that bad, if you don't believe you're a sinner incapable of saving yourself, this isn't going to make sense to you today. And that's why we started there. We have to be convinced of what sin means for us. Sin doesn't mean that we've slipped up a little bit. And um, as Laura's children's sermon demonstrates, we went back to last week. Remember I asked that question, are we ignorant or are we evil? I think Laura was making a case that she was being evil in that case. It's not that she didn't know what she shouldn't do, but she did it. Something in her heart wants us to do that. Something in our heart drives us to do those kind of things. So what does God do with people like that? If that is the case, is that I am hopelessly, helplessly locked away, a slave to my own sin, then what hope do I have in salvation? Well, my hope is in sovereign grace, in God's acting for me, to me. Uh, So let's read Ephesians chapter 1. 
uh, and we'll read these 14 verses. We're not going to look, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the reason we're not going to look at, in depth at lots of this passage is a year ago today, um, I preached to you on this passage and we looked um, a, uh, a little more in depth uh, to, uh, at it then. Last year, I wanted us to focus on the gospel. What's the plain, basic message of the gospel? As you may have surmised already this year, I want us to look at grace. Now, those two aren't inseparable. You can't have gospel without grace, and you certainly can't have grace without gospel. But um, we're delving into grace because we want to know the truth of the gospel. And so, once again, let's read this together and answer this question. What did God choose to do with helpless sinners like us? Here's... Paul's word to the Ephesians. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment. To bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. I hope you feel the depth and the width of that passage. I hope you feel the passion of the Apostle Paul who literally um, just over... Uh, joyed with the prospect of, of picturing this salvation in Jesus Christ, um, what that means. And we last year when we looked at that passage for several weeks, we talked about what it meant to be chosen by God, redeemed by the Son, and marked or preserved by the Holy Spirit. And we talked about in relation to that being our position that's given to us. Verse 4 said, we are holy and blameless in our sight. That's something that's already accomplished in us. So what did God choose to do with helpless sinners like us? He chose to make us holy and blameless. How did he do that? By uniting us with, our son, with his son. He gave us that position of holy and blameless, but he gave us a place in the family that we were predestined for adoption to sonship, that God brought us into his family through Jesus Christ according to his pleasure and his will. Why did he do it? He gave us a position, he gave us a place because God took pleasure in doing it out of his love. And finally, he gave us a purpose. It says, to the praise, verse 6, of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Why did God do all this? Because it points to who he is, his glorious grace, sovereign grace. So notice what Paul says here, that God's doing all the doing here. Do you see the verbs in each consecutive verse in that passage? Where if you still have your Bible open, you can see this. Verse 3, he blessed us. Verse 4, he chose us. Verse 5, he predestined us. Verse 6, he freely gave us grace. Verse 7 and 8, he lavished grace upon us. In verse 9, he made known to us the mystery of his will. So the answer to that question is people who are not righteous, who don't seek God, who have no understanding, what did God do? He blessed, he chose, he predestined, he freely gave, he lavished grace Upon us, and he makes known to those who have no understanding, he makes known. Notice none of those verbs imply any 
mere invitation to come to God. It's God who's acting, who's working, who's doing all these things. That's what sovereign grace is, that God is the one who does all these things. In fact, in this whole passage, it really gives no credit at all to man in this. It's just describing how it is that hopeless, helpless, dead sinners are made alive in Jesus Christ by God himself, and it's by God's work, not by our own. If you keep reading in Ephesians, it it drives home that point um, in the second chapter. For it is by grace you have been saved and not by works so that no one can boast. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. God does all that in us. So what do we make of that? If these uh, are the doctrines of grace, if all those things that are mentioned there are being chosen, predestined, and given, and lavished, and all the other things, what does that mean for us? Well, Another preacher named Mark Webb, much more modern day preacher, said this, that after he gave a brief survey of the doctrines of sovereign grace, what we've been talking about here, he said, I asked for questions um, from the class that he was teaching, and one lady in particular was quite troubled, he said. She said, this is the most awful thing I have ever heard. You make it sound as if God is intentionally turning away men and women who would be saved, receiving only the elect. I answered her in this vein, and quote, he said, you misunderstand the situation. You're visualizing that God is standing at the door of heaven and men are thronging to get in the door. And God is saying to various ones, yes, you may come, but not you, and you, but not you, etc. The situation is hardly this. He says, rather, God stands at the door of heaven with his arms outstretched, inviting all to come. Yet all men, without exception, are running in the opposite direction towards hell as hard as they can go. That's the picture that we've painted. Um, I hope you're grasping that concept of what it means to be a sinner in the sight of God. It just doesn't mean that God is displeased with us. It means we're in rebellion, full-on rebellion, warring against God, not only with our lives but in our heart. If you remember last week, the passage from Romans, we talked about the things that come out of our mouth, the things that we do with our hands and our feet, the condition of our own heart is in complete rebellion to God. So what does God do with people like that? Well, this passage that we just read says he chooses, he saves, he freely, lavishly gives sovereign grace. It's our only hope in salvation. Let's look at, real quickly, one other passage. And we're only going to look at this briefly. We'll pick this up again next week. So if you have more questions than I'm going to answer, and you surely will here today, be patient and we'll come back to this next week. But this is Romans chapter 8, a very well-known passage. And I hope a passage that you'll come to love and you'll come to appreciate is offering great hope to us um, despite what questions may arise in it. Romans 8, 28 uh, through 30 says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Now, many of us know that verse. In fact, we memorize that verse and we like to throw it out to people in difficult times and remind them God is accomplishing something good. But don't separate it from the rest of this passage. How is it that all things can work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose? How can that be? How can we look at the life that we live and say God's accomplishing something good? And it's because this, because before the foundations of the world, as Ephesians says, Romans says, God began a process of salvation. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that we might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. 
That's Paul's description from the beginning to the end. That God knows and loves those before the world was ever formed. And in doing so, he chose them, he predestined them, he elected them, whatever word you want to use there, to be conformed to the image of his son. In other words, he didn't just say, I'm going to draw a line. Some of you are on this side and some of you are on this side. He said, I'm choosing these people and I'm going to do a work in them. I'm going to take helpless, hopelessly lost sinners and I'm going to make them like my son, Jesus Christ. And he says, all those who I have chosen, I will also call. So he's not worried about, is that work going to be complete in anybody? He says, I'm going to make sure that work will be done. And those who he calls, he's going to justify. That means to be made right before God, that our sins will be paid for. And all those who belong to God, who've been called, who are now justified, who are found not guilty on the basis of what Christ has done, I'm going to get you all the way through to the end in glorification. I will get you to the end. So God is, this process is taking place for new, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. Now next week I want to take up A few things that people say, all right, and some of you are asking these questions. Hold on now. Are you saying, and I'm going to take some of those up today. I just want to do the first one here today. That we start with, so you say foreknew. Does that mean that God looks into the future and he chooses those who will choose him? And my first argument against that is really just a common sense one. And oftentimes in Christian theology, common sense, um, the way it, because it's from a human perspective, doesn't always make a lot of sense. But in this case, I think it does. Does anybody really think, if I said today, how many of you want to go to lunch with me today? And a few of you raised your hand. Hopefully somebody would. And all those that raised their hand, I said, all right, I'm choosing you to go to lunch with me. The rest of you, I'm not choosing. Is that a choice? Did I really choose you or did you choose me? So in one sense, that argument that God's just looking into the future to see what people will do given the opportunity doesn't always hold water for me. But also, if this is the way, all those that were foreknown were, pre- foreknown were predestined, all those that were predestined were called, justified, and glorified, all those he gets to the end If foreknew only meant that he looked to see what would happen, it doesn't account for our helpless, hopeless estate. If God looked into the future and saw your choice, what is Romans and the other passages we looked at last week, what has that already told us? We won't make that choice if God doesn't intervene and do something miraculously for us. It doesn't matter if it happens a hundred years ago today or a million years from now. God doesn't need to look into the future. Our estate will never change. We came into this world a sinner and we will always be a sinner locked away in our own sin until and unless God does a work of sovereign grace. That's why foreknowledge has to mean what most will make a case for is that God knew in a sense that he already knew who belonged to him. He already had chosen them out of his own love and out of his own will to belong to him. That's why we talk about his lavish love upon us, his free and gracious love. One other place in the scriptures that mentions this idea of foreknowing has to do with Jesus. And it wouldn't make sense does Jesus' foreknowledge of his own son look to the future and say how would Jesus handle this situation? In one of the first sermons ever preached after the time of Christ in Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching to a Jewish audience and he says, this man, speaking of Jesus, was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God You nailed him to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. You see, God not only chose you before the foundations of the world, he also had already chosen his son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins. That's how he could choose you. He didn't choose to overlook your sins. He chose to pay for your sins with his own precious son. So last week I started with this question. Are people ignorant or are, or are they evil? And God's word tells us that people are evil. 
No one is righteous, not even one. No one seeks after God. No one understands. So God does not foreknow those who come to faith. This is what John Piper says, apart from his creating that faith, because there are no such people who choose God on their own. Whoever believes has been called into faith by the sovereign grace of God. When God looks from eternity into the future and sees the faith of the elect, he sees his own work. Now think about that. When God looks into the future and he sees anyone of faith, he sees someone that is a recipient of sovereign grace. And he chose to do that work for dead, blind, and rebellious sinners unconditionally. For we are not capable of meeting the condition of faith. We are spiritually dead and spiritually blind. So where does that leave us? No one is elect will not believe and trust in Jesus. That's the question I get when this subject of election always comes up. What if I'm elect and don't know it? You know how you know if you're counted among the elect? Is if you have faith in Jesus Christ. Because if you have faith in Jesus Christ, he has to have done this work of sovereign grace in you or you would have no faith. So for those of us today, particularly as we speak to the church today, those of us who feel some assurance of salvation to say, I am a person of faith, and I know many of you are here today. I believe most of you are here today. Well, how does that affect our lives? You know, without some application of this, I always say this to our Bible studies, I'm not interested in teaching vocabulary um, to Christian people. I'm interested in teaching the truth of God's Word. And if this is the truth, and I believe with all my heart that it is, that we are hopelessly, helplessly lost sinners who cannot save ourselves, that God has intervened miraculously in our lives and changed us in a way that enables us and draws us to himself to save us from our sins, then how then should we live? Well, I was reading an article this week by a guy named Ray Ortland. You may know his name from different Christian circles. He's a prolific writer. And he talks about the difference in Christian doctrine and Christian culture. And he makes a case that you can't have a doctrine that doesn't affect your culture. And I want you to know this. Take your bulletin, if you have one, and look at the back of your bulletin again. I refer to this from time to time. It has our core values on there. And our core values start with, number one, the gospel. We are a church that stands on the gospel for our mission and our message. If the good news is good news that Jesus saves sinners like us, that's our starting point for everything. What we teach, what we preach, and how we live and what we do in our community. But secondly, and goes hand in hand with it, is grace. Why am I going to spend weeks talking about one little word? It's because this. Because we believe that all of salvation is undeserved grace. It's God's sovereign grace. It's solely a gift of God. And notice what this says. And I hope you believe this is true. And I hope this is part of your um, calling as a member of First Presbyterian Church. We seek to live a life that reflects that grace in all we do and to minister in a way that extends that grace to a fallen world. You see, if we leave here today and go, oh, that was some pretty heavy doctrine, I think I get it, I'm glad I'm one of the people who understands that, but we don't understand how that should affect us. If you really believe you are hopelessly, helplessly lost, and God did a miraculous work of grace to save you from your own sin, a rebellious sinner that was running towards hell as fast as you could, and God did something to intervene in your life, then how do we not live a life of gratitude and service to him that wants to extend that same grace to as many people as possible. And next week we'll talk about the accusation against this doctrine. If God does all of it, why do I need to play a part in it? And I'll just simply answer it in short here today. Why would you not? If you understand what it means to receive sovereign grace, why would you not proclaim it? Why would you not give praise to the glorious grace of God? Every church culture 
is communicating something, Ray Ortland says. If a church is not positively communicating the gospel both by what it says and what it is, then that church risks unsaying what, it re what in reality is what it's saying by its theory. Um, it's a complicated way of saying if you don't live as a person of grace, um, don't say you're a person of grace because we can't be one and not the other. If we truly trust in, believe in, and rejoice in God's sovereign grace, choosing me, a sinner, to be his own child, then my life, our church, will reflect that kind of thing in who we are, what we do, and how we serve. I pray that that will be true in, in our church, in our community, in this world today. The glorious gospel of Jesus Christ would be lifted up and held out here and everywhere and always. Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, it is uh, with great joy uh, that we have uh, heard the gospel and we've responded to it because you have done something in our lives that uh, all of us here who call upon the, the Lord Jesus in faith today have had a change of heart uh, that came from you. And it was a change that was predetermined before the foundations of the earth were even laid that you chose us to be children of God and that you have overcome our sin and our shame and our rebellion. And in Jesus Christ, you have brought us to yourself. And I pray that as we live this life, we would live in light of that. Um, that we would be people of grace, sovereign grace, that rejoices that we have a heavenly father that saved sinners like us. Uh, so do that work in our heart this day. And we'll give you praise and glory and honor as we do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Ask our music folks before we started.